President Trump now has a primary challenger, former Massachusetts Governor Bill Weld, officially jumping into the race, saying that if Trump is reelected, it would be, quote, a political tragedy, end quote. So what will he focus on and what's his path to victory? Let's ask him. Republican presidential candidate Bill Weld joins us now. Good morning, Governor. Allison, great to be with you as always from sunny Manchester, New Hampshire. It looks beautiful there at the moment. So, so Governor, um, let's just start with your path to victory, because as you well know, history does not have a lot of examples of primary challenger, challengers to incumbent presidents being successful. And so what makes you think that this moment is any different? Well, well, actually, the last five primary challengers to a sitting president running for re-election, those presidents all lost. And when there's no primary challengers, those presidents all won of the last 10 such elections. So that's a, that's a data point. Uh, politically, if you want the nuts and bolts, uh, my strategy would be focus initially on the six New England states uh, with particular emphasis on New Hampshire, because if I can show very well in New Hampshire, or even win the New Hampshire primary, that has kind of a domino effect on other primaries around the country, almost an electrical effect. The first in the nation primary is what gives New Hampshire a lot of its clout uh, as a state. I think my next stop probably would be the mid-Atlantic states. I've spent a lot of time, native of New York, uh, spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania, uh, Maryland, Delaware. Uh, early on, I'll be doing partly for fundraising and partly for political reasons. They uh, sweep through the West, California, Oregon, Washington. Uh, Mr. Trump and California don't seem to get along well. So th there, I think there's some real promise there. And California has moved its primary from the middle of June up to much earlier. Hmm. Uh, and then there's the Intermountain West, some of the mountain states. Uh, and the last question would be the Rust Belt. I think a place like Wisconsin, I could do well. Uh, I know the president won that state at, at the end. Uh, it was uh, ignored by the Democrats the last 30 days of the election. And, and the Republicans did not do well there in the no. midterm. So uh, that's, you know, there are places in the deep south which would be tough, I grant you. But the rest of the country, fair game. I think it's interesting to hear your strategy, but back to <clears throat> history for a second. When the incumbents haven't won, <clears throat> basically the primary challenger has weakened the incumbent. But it's not that the challenger has won. And so is that your strategy? No, no, that's correct. That, that, that's correct, uh, but my strategy that I just laid out for you, that's a strategy to win. That's not a strategy to weaken anybody. And, uh, you know, I'm in this, uh, I think, for the best reasons. I've spent a lot of time uh, governing in, in an executive capacity. Uh, when I was governor of Massachusetts, I cut spending in real terms. I was voted the most uh, fiscally conservative governor in the United States. Uh, I think even with all deference to his office, I don't think Mr. Trump is an economic conservative. He hasn't vetoed one dollar uh, of, uh, of spending. Uh, I like the tax cut. I cut taxes 15 times. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how serious Mr. Trump is about governing, honestly. Uh, he has a one-word uh, environmental policy uh, hoax, uh, a one-word uh, uh, immigration policy wall. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think sometimes his lack of uh, experience uh, in preparation for the office shows. Well, given all of that, nine out of 10 Republicans approve of the job that President Trump is doing. Here's a poll. 89 percent um, of Republicans still say that they approve of the job that he's doing. And so it doesn't sound like they're looking for an alternative at the moment. Well, they haven't been offered. They haven't been offered an alternative uh, until now. And, and now they have. And I get to start making my case. And I got to tell you, I've been in New Hampshire a lot uh, since I gave my initial speech in February. Uh, and I get a very good response. You know, there's probably a couple people a day who say, I'm OK. No, no, I don't want to shake anybody's hand. But everyone else says, thank you so much uh, for what you're doing. So I think those polls you're reading about Republicans, those are dominated by the Republican state committee, town committee members who are absolutely under the thumb of the Republican National Committee and the Trump campaign who have issued orders Please keep there from being any primary. Please avoid any contest. And at the end of the day, it's going to come out to who shows up to vote in those primaries. In New Hampshire and Massachusetts and 18 other states, independents, unenrolled voters can take a Republican mm -hmm. ballot on primary day. And my job is to make sure that millennials, Gen Xers, uh, suburban female <coughs> voters who might not uh, buy all of Mr. Trump's dog food uh, take that uh, take that Republican mm. ballot. And I've heard from a lot of people, including Democrats, not even all conservative Democrats. I've heard liberal Democrats say they're going to take that Republican ballot so they can come in and vote for me because they want to cast a vote directly against Mr. Mm. Trump. 
So one of the questions is how many Democrats are going to say, I'd like to cast a vote directly against Mr. Yeah. Trump instead of throwing a dart at one of 15, very good, but still one of 15 Democratic candidates. No, that's interesting. That's an interesting math calculation to see how that goes. Let's talk about the issues. So you brought up the economy. Mm -hmm. Under President Trump, um, the U.S. has added $2 trillion to the federal debt. How do you explain that Republicans don't seem to be that concerned anymore about this? You know, I am. Uh, I think it's an unfair burden on millennials and Gen Xers who are going to have to pay that bill. And people don't understand the long-term consequences of these deficits. Uh, you know, when I came into office, uh, the outgoing administration said the state is bankrupt. We cannot pay our bills as they fall due. Well, the federal government, with going on $30 trillion in debt now, could not pay its bills as they fall due unless the Chinese and others bought up our treasuries. And the day when the Chinese and other countries say, we're not going to buy your treasuries anymore, it's not enough that the dollar is the reserve uh, currency. We'll be unable to meet our obligations as they fall due. And that's called insolvency. And nobody in Washington worries about that because they love to spend money. The Dems want to spend more money on social programs. The Republicans want to spend more money on uh, military, you know, 5 percent each. Then they, at the end of the day, they argue, argue, argue. Then they get together and decide to compromise by raising everything 10 percent. You couldn't do that in a state government. All state governors are required by their constitution to balance their budget. And the truth is we should have the same requirement for the federal government. I want to ask you about this new report that the attorney general mm -hmm. is changing the immigration law in order to hold <clears throat> asylum seekers indefinitely in detention, in prison, um, to hold them even if they have a legitimate claim of asylum. You know, there's a problem, obviously, at the border. There's a humanitarian crisis. The numbers have spiked of families showing up. What's the answer? Well, that's not the answer. Listen, I knew Bill Barr in the old days, and he's a hell of a guy and a hell of a lawyer and very strong. And as he said in his confirmation uh, uh, hearings, uh, he intends not to be bullied. But uh, he's 0 for 2 recently. This hold him indefinitely in prison so they can't get asylum. Uh, that doesn't strike me as particularly lawful. Uh, the, the thing a couple of weeks ago where he said if uh, the FBI opens an investigation uh, on uh, a Trump organization, that that's spying. That's not spying. Uh, our country separates the investigative and the prosecutive function. I spent seven years in the Justice Department, and I was head of the criminal division of Maine Justice mm -hmm. in Washington trying to keep the politics out of law enforcement. It's very corrosive uh, when that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, I resigned from the department because I thought the attorney general had not taken off his White House hat when he came over to head the Justice Department. So I take that very seriously. And when an agency opens an investigation, it may be a lot of things. It may be bad news for the target, but it's not spying. It's just opening an investigation. OK, very quickly, uh, the Mueller report is going to come out tomorrow. You uh, have said you were his boss in the 1980s um, as the uh, attorney, U.S. attorney for District of Manhattan. You've said it was frightening to be Robert Mueller's boss. Why was that? Well, no, he's not only one of the most, uh, he's the straightest guy I've ever met. Absolutely ramrod uh, straight, marvelous person, uh, and uh, very, very thorough as a prosecutor. That was our hallmark uh, in the office, both in Boston and Washington, is negative all avenues of escape for the target of your investigation. And we did that. That's why we got 109 convictions out of 111 public corruption cases. My political guess is that the release of the report is going to be a non-event. Whatever mm -hmm. life there was in the report will have been squeezed out of it by the time it's released. The truth is the whole damn thing should be made public except for classified information. Mm -hmm. And I think it's OK to take out some of the derogatory stuff. Mm -hmm. But I find it telling that the dominant emotion in Washington appears to be fear of the president's wrath. How that much anger can get into one head and stay there, uh, I don't know how he can even remotely approach getting the job done. He's so angry about so many things in so many directions all the time. You need calm in the Oval Office. OK, now to our music lightning round. Here at New Day, we love music. We love to hear about people's favorite bands, et cetera. Um, I'm trapped in the 80s, musically. Uh, John Berman is a deadhead. Poppy Harlow here loves country music. What is your favorite music genre, Governor? 
I, I came up on the Stones and, and then the Dead, particularly American Beauty and uh, Working Man's Dead. A little bit later, I thought Suzanne Vega was very cool mm. uh, of current singers. Uh, Jesse Winchester, you know, that type of country. I really like uh, Little Feet. Uh, Katie Lang, I think, is the best singer alive. If I get, <clears throat> if I get in office, man, she's she's singing at the the first the first party. And there'll be a lot of parties uh, in the White House and a lot of music uh, parties. I, I I couldn't be more uh, under the thumb, as Mick Jagger might say. <laughs> Governor, why didn't you lead with that? The fact that there are going to be concerts at the White House and parties at the White House isn't that alone enough for people to vote for you? Well, I think it might be enough for the millennials and the Gen Xers oh. and, uh, and the baby boomers like me. Uh, we're, you know, we're only stoners in the, in the sense that we love the Rolling Stones. Sure. Sure. Thank you for clarifying that.